Ignan Velivela, welcome to the Deep End. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for inviting me and I'm glad we got to connect and uh, yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, so many things uh, I'd love to speak with you about. We're obviously talking about your company, A to B. We're talking about you know your, your time at On Deck, but we're also zooming out and looking at a bigger conversation topic of supply chains, truckers, all those really interesting details. I want to start with both your background and then also obviously your journey through the idea maze to actually get at this company. So I'm particularly interested in the fact that before you started working in A to B, you were actually working in the self-driving car space, right. which obviously if you follow this technical area, you hear a lot of talk about how self-driving cars would basically make it so you wouldn't even need truckers in the future, which is obviously not the world that we're living in, in 2023 and 2022, 2021. So can you just tell the story of your career and your interests through the lens really of those two topic areas, the self-driving, but then obviously the deep actual needs at a human level that truckers have? No, happy to. And uh, uh, maybe I can start uh, from the very beginnings, which is, uh, so I grew up in India originally, and uh, uh, I grew up in a very small town outside of a large city called Hyderabad. And uh, I'm pretty much not used to trucking as an industry, so it was very new to me when we were starting A to B. But uh, I think the guiding principle for me when we were uh, thinking about what to work on uh, has been the same one on which I also built my primary career, which is uh, I wanted to work on something useful and important. And uh, uh, I grew up uh, learning about engineering and uh, was fascinated by things like electric vehicles, uh, things like grid scale storage technologies. In fact, that was my uh, college uh, thesis uh, back in uh, early 2010s. And uh, th this was when Tesla or electric cars were not popular. And uh, I vividly remember my department had uh, kind of mocking saying that, you know, this is not going to happen in this decade or this uh, rather this half of the century because uh, the unit economics just don't make sense for battery cars. And I kind of reflect on that uh, very experience because I was uh, more stubborn about, uh, you know, things ha working out because uh, on a first principles basis, uh, if you break down any technology, you'll realize that uh, whether you want to move bits or atoms, uh, ultimately uh, cost is a function of scale. Like uh, if it can work in a small size, it uh, over time you can scale it, make it cheaper, make it more efficient, and eventually profitable too. And uh, I, I think that's how I think about payments also. So uh, out of college, I started a payments company in India. And uh, the problem we were really working on was to effectively offer uh, micro loans, like to people who don't have bank accounts. And unfortunately, uh, in India, most of, uh, most of the rural population and uh, a good portion of the urban poor don't have a bank account and they have a smartphone. I think one of the success stories of India's telecom uh, industry has been to have a lot of cell phones at very cheap rates. And so we were trying to build like a digital wallet and a mobile peer-to-peer -peer payment system. And uh, and this was like at a time when uh, digital payments were not common in India. And we got a ton of learnings, but ultimately that uh, experiment was failed. Uh, the reason uh, I look back on that experience as, and cherish that experience is that I got to learn a ton of things about payments and uh, uh, and we were trying to solve things for people in India which had nothing to do with trucking and fleet payments today but the foundations were very uh, uh, clear for me on what, what are things required to, the building blocks that are required to make something useful here. And when I moved to the US I've uh, studied uh, uh, Rewardix partly because I was interested in like the uh, self-driving cars uh, and worked for cruise automation. And uh, cruise is at this intersection of uh, working on electric vehicles and also autonomous vehicles, which I think is an inevitable future. Like so the question is just around how many decades it might take. Will it be happening in this decade or will it be like a 50 year transition? And I think most people kind of underestimate the manufacturing and the scaling required to actually build cars at scale. So even if we have, let's say, self-driving vehicles tomorrow, uh, to actually replenish the entire fleet we have today will still take at least 25 to 30 years at current manufacturing scale. So, uh, and uh, I think uh, 
uh, when we started uh, A to B, uh, the funny story is like payments was not the thing I wanted to really do because secretly I was like, there's probably something more interesting than payments I can think about doing, which is uh, maybe do something around artificial intelligence, maybe doing something around uh, better or faster adoption of self-driving cars and uh, uh, both me and my co-founders like so I met uh, my co-founder Harshita uh, who uh, 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 much more in a social way in that uh, uh, she, she uh, was someone who was uh, at 16 dropped out of high school in India and uh, decided to start a company she was a self-taught programmer and uh, that was a story that I found was very admirable and inspiring so I actually cold emailed her the f first time I moved to the San Francisco area and uh, I met her over coffee and I, actually I uh, met her over chocolate she's not into coffee and uh, <laughs> and we were just like discussing about self-driving cars and uh, eventually we got to know each other well and uh, 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 over time, because I was working at Cruise, I used to always share notes with her about transportation, about uh, ride-sharing businesses, like back in the day, uh, electric scooters were popular and we were just like discussing about what works and what doesn't work in terms of unit economics or things like that. And eventually, as a nat uh, natural extension to that, when I thought about building the company, I asked her if she was interested to, you know, uh, iterate with us and along with the ride came uh, Tushar, my third co-founder and uh, Tushar was uh, an early team member at Uber in India so he had some background in transportation not necessarily trucking and uh, he was uh, just uh, I think uh, 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 tried building something around electric scooters and uh, could not really scale it. He was also completing his uh, business school and uh, he wound on that company, but he really wanted to go back to the uh, founder's journey of zero to one. And so he joined us as the third co-founder. And between the three of us, we were early on uh, trying to see if we can commercialize uh, better shared transportation in the US. And so we were looking at, can we aggregate buses? Can we do something better with uh, any other version of shared transportation? And this was with this simple uh, end goal, which is, you know, shared transportation is good for cities. It is good for the environment. People uh, can save on time and congestion on the roads. And uh, we got started off uh, sometime around uh, late uh, 2020 and, uh, uh, sorry, early 2020. And, uh, Basically, uh, within few months of us starting the company, uh, we got into on deck, and you know, uh, both me and Harshita were some of the early uh, batches of on deck. I'd love to hear, and obviously, it's been a couple of years since that early 2020 period, so I expect the company's kind of shifted a different bit. But if it's, let's say, February 2020, you are in on deck, you have this company, you've got a great name, A to B. Help us understand the problem that you noticed and you were trying to address and fix. Yeah, I, I mean, um, it's one of those things where early on in your journey, uh, you have I, I, we had like a sense of uh, direction, which is like, okay, we want to briefly uh, try to go deeper into the transportation space and understand more about pain points uh, users have. And uh, uh, so we effectively had a, a compass, but not really a map. And uh, mm. and so we were trying to figure out what is the uh, re uh, important problem we can work on or useful problem that you know our users have suggested. And I think one of the ways we have tried to build the company is to always be uh, proactive with asking customers, asking potential users, what, what are some of the uh, pain points they see or how they are doing things. And in that process, we try to look at commuting as a pain point. And uh, in fact, we started a, a, a Effectively, like our MVP was trying to build a bus network for Bay Area, and uh, this, this was uh, in the day when uh, months before COVID hit. And uh, as we tried to ramp that idea, COVID uh, uh, shut down everything, and <laughs> so we had to go back to the drawing board uh, uh, and uh, you know iterate again. I think, but, but Can I pause you there, real sure. quick. Because like obviously this episode is about bigger problems in transportation. Could you help me understand? Because maybe some founder wants to pick this up now that um, SF is knock on wood, hopefully back. Yeah. What gap in the SF transportation network would a bus serve? Because it's kind of like that meme, there are buses already. <laughs> Why did you need another set of buses in San Francisco? No, uh, happy to. Uh, so if you think about uh, most uh, cities uh, uh, in 
fast developing uh, regions of the world like asia particularly you would see that uh, a sizable portion of their population actually use some version of shared transportation so it it could be uh, the common train system it could be some version of shared buses or vehicles which are like vans uh, and and the reason is uh, it's so much more efficient for time wise you don't have to spend uh, your time commuting time behind the wheel and also uh, it it's so much energy efficient and w- a model which we were particularly looking forward to was what google or facebook and companies of that scale have built which is they all have employee shuttles and anybody who is working at google or facebook they can potentially afford a car but they still like to take this employee shuttle because it saves them a ton of time hours every day and lot lot more in uh, commuting stress and we were trying to see if we can replicate that to smaller companies too and we we were basically uh, asking lot of these uh, smaller companies companies with like 10 employees all the way to 1000 plus employees how come they don't have an employee shuttle and what we realized is it's a question of scale which is unless you have like facebook scale or google scale companies it's not very easy to build something that's uh, affordable or profitable and uh, th- that's when we realized that this is exactly the type of problem you know uber and lyft also tried to solve which is uh, if you get a certain critical mass you can reduce wait times and you can basically have a, a co- cost basis that's mostly affordable for uh, all office commuters and the gap we saw was if you want to really do long distance commuting so uh, just a quick uh, statistic on us commuting roughly 1/3 of us commuters drive 3 uh, hours plus every day to do long distance commuting and uh, it's not just a bay area phenomena you can see that in seattle you can see that in la you can see that in uh, new york or even in large cities in texas too and uh, all these like large urban cities which have dense population centers still have people roughly one third of them driving 3 hours a day and that we thought was a colossal waste of time which is uh, not something that helps uh, either the commuters or the people uh, or the cities where congestion is a uh, growing problem and that's how we started with uh, looking at buses and we knew that and we uh, spoke to like tens of users who were taking these employee shuttles we also spoke to 100 plus users uh just like uh, talking to them about who were using bart or caltrain or were driving to work just to understand what is the price point they would rather pay for what is the frequency of operations they would want and we were trying to just like iterate on that and what we also were doing in parallel is think about how do we think about uh it with 10 vehicles and then 100 vehicles and how how should that business model scale and what we realized is we should not buy buses we should operate like what uber or lyft is which is build a marketplace aggregate the supply and aggregate the demand and create that uh, matching process and th- that's what we did so we had over 5 600 buses uh, signed up over a gra- gra- period of 1 to 2 months we spoke to small businesses who operate these buses and they these are the same quality of buses that google and apple have and for a 10 dollars ticket you basically can ride to from san francisco to san jose uh, in like a air conditioned fast wifi enabled buses and so and we got like early traction uh, once we you know started operating and uh, th- this was like by month 3 or month 4 when uh, we were trying to scale even further and that's when covid hit and we had to pause on all that operations yeah it's a perfect place to end that story because it seems as if we're going to take a big jump if you're listening to this podcast or watching it obviously because we're going from one set of users right so most likely like white collar professionals in the bay area who see a bunch of their friends on the google or the meta bus and are liking the opportunity to do something similar to a whole other set of customers who that being truckers right your your company has been self described as you know stripe for truckers so help us understand the jump you had to make um in terms of those customers and the different set of problems because you're describing people who your first problem is you have people who need to get from their homes right. to work to users who their entire work actually is that commute so help us understand that no absolutely so uh uh i, I think in many ways uh <laughs> that uh, that pivot was a blessing in disguise because uh, we kind of in retrospect realized that you know it was not like a great idea it was like an okay idea probably it might scale to few cities but it's not like something that would really uh, transform that industry and and, and uh, but i think one thing we vividly remember was 
as founders, we were basically doing everything. So we were building the mobile app, we were building the website, we were also working on going, standing at the uh, bu bu uh, pickup points where the buses used to come and basically get people on board. And we were doing everything in a scrappy way. We we didn't, I think, have even raised a uh, seed round by then. So we had like some angel investors just like put in some uh, small checks. And we were just trying to make it all work. And during that process, uh, during daytime, we were working on just like uh, the users and getting all these buses running. Nighttime, we used to just like manually uh, do wire transfers and also do things like checks and pay people. Uh, and uh, methods we otherwise wouldn't do for if you are paying to a uh, tech startup. And we used to think for ourselves like, how come there's no one who's tried to automate all these invoices and try to make this much more seamless experience. And these are like at the same time uh, bus operators who have like millions of dollars in revenue or probably tens of millions in revenue. And they're doing everything manually. So they ask for checks, they prefer to uh, do email for invoices, they, they haven't really built an ARAP system. And, uh, and we were uh, discussing about this experience, we were also surprised like how come a commercial fleet industry has uh, such broken uh, problems and so just to validate this further we went to truck stops all over California and uh, uh, we tried to just understand the industry in the front lines where it's happening and so uh, most trucking that you see uh, doesn't really happen inside uh, dense cities like San Francisco or the Bay Area it happens hours outside it so the, the biggest warehouses from Amazon to Walmart to everybody are in towns like Stockton or Tracy or places like Bakersfield, which is outside of LA. And uh, that's where you see all the action in logistics because uh, you have the truck drivers there, you have the small business owners who operate these trucking companies. You also have the giant warehouses where all the good movement happen. And what we heard from these small business owners and the truck drivers is that uh, in many ways, they're running on a parallel payment network. So they don't use a traditional Visa or a MasterCard credit card for paying p p uh, for items. They don't use uh, payroll software like how we use Gusto or Rippling to pay for their employees. And su surprisingly, these are like well-run, profitable businesses. At the same time, uh, have all these uh, I issues uh, which are much more manual and they all complained about them. So it's not that they love uh, what they're doing. It's just that uh, they don't see an alternative. And uh, that's when we uh, thought there's a recurring theme of you know payments being a broken problem. And uh, so we tried to go deeper into this and just understand why they were using all these uh, broken tools. And you know we tried to uh, uh, build like an MVP from there. And I can go into more detail depending on uh, you know, how much you would want to learn about our uh, uh, the iteration process. But I, I think that was the uh, origin to how we uh, moved to payments. Can you, before we get, because I actually do want to get into those details, sure. especially because I think folks are going to be looking to get a picture of the trucking industry. But I want to go back to something I hinted at at the start of the conversation, with, which is the self-driving right. like car conversation. Um, because before the recording, we were talking about how, in, in, in many ways, you know, the trucking industry, the story we're telling is, is, is deeply personal. Um, you know, these are 1099 contractors. There's a specific lifestyle that's like structured around this industry. Um, but if I were to go back into 2018, 2019, a lot of the conventional wisdom was, well, and I'm not meaning this in a hand wavy way, but eventually this is the definition of an industry that's going to, that's going to become self driving because you're just, you know, point A, point B, you're going between it. So can you just kind of speak to how you think of the quote unquote future of the American trucking industry in the context of someone who's thinking about the self-driving space, but also is at the core of your business now, thinking about all of the deep human problems that actual truckers are experiencing? By all means, trucking is the bedrock industry for the country in, uh, in terms of goods movement. And if you think about anything that's in your room today, like practically anything that you see that's a physical nature, it's brought by tr a, tr a truck at some point of time. So whether it's from the factory to the warehouse or the warehouse to the store, the store to the your own home. And uh, we kind of never interact with trucking as a consumer directly. So we have always looked at trucking as an industry that's running in the background. So just like how utilities are. 
you don't really understand or have to know about the complexity of the power grid or you don't have to know how the plumbing has to really work for you to get water every day. At the same time, uh, that level of reliability came with decades of infrastructure that has to be built around it. So uh, there are hundreds of thousands of businesses who are actively uh, involved in trucking every day. And, and the most interesting part about US trucking, and uh, it also extends broadly to other developed countries, is uh, trucking is a small business driven industry. The, there is no real monopoly in trucking. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, the biggest of uh, retail companies or uh, logistics companies, they still have only one to 2% of market share. So th there's no single company which has few percentage or even 5% market share. And most of the industry is run by uh, trucking businesses that are between two to 10 trucks. And that's the majority or, the, uh, or rather the uh, largest component of the industry. And what you see is that this is a fairly complex orchestration process. So, uh, you have to get your food irrespective of whether there's a snowstorm in the Midwest or whether there's like drought in a particular region or a wildfire in California. And that kind of complexity uh, is, uh, is you know, uh, not something we, we as consumers are used to on a day-to-day -day basis, but trucking companies deal with on a daily basis. So I think uh, uh, automating everything is not uh, the easy answer here. So when it comes to self-driving trucks, uh, uh, I see semi-autonomous vehicles as like a very important transition. So if you look at a uh, semi-autonomous uh, car today, uh, like for example, cars that are going by themselves on highways, but require a human driver behind the wheel, I think that's significantly more important in the short term. Uh, in the long term, I don't think uh, self-driving trucks are going to uh, are, are going to happen. So they, they, they are going to happen and it's an in inevitable future. So just like electric is an inevitable future, which is over time, I don't know exactly will it be 50 years or 30 years or 10 years, but uh, that transition is uh, in inevitable because it's the most energy efficient way. It's also the uh, most cost economical way. And um, especially in an industry like uh, trucking, uh, the number of people who are involved with trucking, both uh, as driving but also in the background, is significantly more than uh, people uh, can usually fathom. Uh, I, one of the statistics that I really like to cite is, uh, as per the last census, almost 29 states, truck driving is the number one profession. So, wow. uh, and states like California, states like Texas, all these large states, truck driving is the number one profession. And, uh, and we don't really uh, kind of think of trucking or truck driving as the most popular thing when you uh, consider jobs. And, uh, and the reason is uh, anyone who's uh, in rural and semi-urban areas with uh, high school educations or low, usually uh, truck driving is a good, well-paying job relative to other service jobs. So if you are working in a warehouse it, the, uh, or any other blue collar profession, the wages are significantly lower compared to working as a truck driver. And I would argue that actually working as a truck driver is a skilled profession because the the actual level of driving skill you would require to uh, manage a 18 wheeler semi rig is significantly more than a, a s simple car. And uh, yeah. yeah. The next question would be, as you're looking at this industry and you're looking at the various pain points that both like the users and the users being the drivers and then the businesses that they're working for encounter, to what degree is the problem a problem of technology? So is there some tool that needs to be developed or is it that the industry, to your point, just hasn't adopted basic practices that you can really adjust for in creating, let's say, a stripe for trucking. How do you think of where the gap actually is? So is it, so let me put it this way, is the challenge for A to B at a company level one of developing new technology or is it about building structures to implement things that already exist right now and are standard in other industries? No, I'm glad you asked that question. So uh, when we were talking to the trucking companies and truck drivers in uh, 
the towns I was describing earlier, one of the uh, things we used to often assume out of our own ignorance is uh, how come people are not using an American Express or a uh, square or a stripe like tools which you know which are commonly used among uh, uh, businesses, uh, especially businesses that are in cities and have uh, some version of a full uh, full full fledged operation. And what we realized is uh, trucking as an industry has very special needs in terms of what kind of data they have to capture on a single transaction, and also the exact standards in which the trucking industry works. So. Uh, for example, uh, uh, truck drivers often use a uh, simple card called a fuel card to pay for fuel. And uh, they don't use a credit card, they don't use a Amex type business card, they use a fuel card. Uh, and this fuel card is uh, such a fascinating payment instrument. It was started sometime in 1960, like so way before there was the internet, way before there was Visa as a card network, there were the fuel cards. And fuel cards were created uh, particularly because uh, truck drivers sp were spending thousands of dollars on fuel every month. And uh, the business owners who were effectively managing these fleets wanted some level of spend control on their on the truck drivers. And so they created the fuel card uh, as a solution to build uh, spend control so that truck drivers don't spend on anything except for fuel. And, and if you are going to a truck stop or a gas station, you can buy food or beverages and, and in trucking parlance, uh, buy Cokes and Smokes. And those are things mm. that uh, a fleet owner doesn't want uh, a truck driver to buy. And how do you do that uh, reliably and uh, from a distance? And so fuel carts were created back in 1960s. And this one simple innovation led to like the entire industry relying on these fuel carts for decades now. And uh, as an average car owner, you would probably never use a fuel card because uh, you don't want to have that level of spend control. But at a macro level, uh, fuel is the largest commodity that's bought or sold using a card network. And, and that level of scale and volume requires a parallel card network to be used. So, and this is the number one cost that a trucking company has. It's higher than labor costs at times. And so, if you have to deal with that level of complexity and have precise spend reporting and spend control, you need a parallel network. So that's when we appreciated that, you know, this is an infrastructure problem. This is not an awareness problem that truckers are ignorant about some particular modern card that a startup uses and a trucker doesn't use. It's actually much more deeper. And that's when we realized that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, all payments is like uh, plumbing in that uh, you basically have to connect two disparate uh, sources of pool, pools of money rather. So from a merchant to a bank, a bank to a consumer and vice versa. And how do you do that reliably? How do you do that over decades old uh, point of sale systems that are not as modern as an online payment service? And, and that's the interesting engineering problem we uh, got ourselves into. And it, it was a rabbit hole we, uh, um, we we're glad that we fell in. Help us um, understand the scale. We've talked a lot about scale this episode. The scale of the opportunity um, that, that you're working with, because obviously you're working with, with truckers, and obviously I can't just describe that as a niche because to your point, it's the foundation that underlies the entire American economy. So if you think of A to B over the next 10 years, are you thinking of this as, as, the, as the company that has the opportunity to build that equivalent of like the 21st century fuel card that undergirds this system? Or are you thinking about transportation more broadly in the long term? How do you think about that? Yeah, we are, we, we are uh, certainly think, thinking about uh, being the infrastructure uh, layer for the entire transportation industry. And what that means is it's not just fuel payments, but we also want to be uh, the providers for other forms of payments. So trucking just in the US is a trillion dollar industry between commercial trucking and some versions of last mile delivery. And uh, so just for sense of scale, that's the size of a G20 country. So if you look at a country like Spain or one of the European economies, uh, trucking in the US is comparable to those G20, uh, both in terms of the number of people that are involved, like tens of millions of people and also the actual size of money and payments that flow through the system. And, and most of trucking is running on 
either paper checks or running on legacy card networks. And both of them are inefficient. And when you hear problems that truckers talk about, they talk about how, uh, you know, uh, in some of our early conversations, we heard uh, business owners tell them, uh, tell us how they almost woke up every week in the middle of the night because their trucker is stuck in a small town in Nebraska or Montana and they have nowhere to go. And, and that kind of problems are not what you come across if you are a consumer using a simple credit card. And uh, and so these are effectively reliability problems. These are problems which are caused due to broken infrastructure. And once you build the infrastructure layer, you can effectively uh, apply to different use cases. So fuel payments is one use case. Payroll for truck drivers is another use case, which is un un unfortunately still an unsolved problem. And as I told you earlier, trucking is the number one profession in like 29 states, and uh, most truckers are still paid using a paper check. And, and we were ourselves surprised, like, uh, you know, if you're a truck driver, you're paid somewhere between 50 to 150K, a uh, wide range depending on full time or part time. But uh, most of them uh, don't get to get a regular paycheck and, and the reason is uh, truckers are paid on a mileage basis so they're not paid on hourly rate like how a regular uh, staff uh, a regular uh, hourly worker is paid their work paid on number of miles they drive on a daily basis so if they drive 300 miles or a 500 mile journey they basically are paid two three weeks later based on their trip and uh, because of that very nature most payroll software often don't support that uh, functionality so your usual payroll software for tech startups are not the ones that trucking companies use. They just use Excel sheets and have to prepare paper checks and post them to a trucker. And this very problem can be solved because this is not uh, an intractable problem. This is a question of like building good software for this industry, making sure money is moving fast. And the way we think about money is uh, ultimately it has to be as fast as email. In that it has to be instant, mm -hmm. it has to be free, it has to be cheap and reliable and operating 24 cross 7. And unfortunately, given the legacy uh, payment stack that the uh, current companies are built on, nothing is instant. So people mostly transact on business days, people wait for days at times or weeks to get paid for what they earned. And all these are problems that are uh, in some sense uh, solved in other industries and has to be solved here. And it cannot be done using a simple software wrapper. It has to be built with uh, the infrastructure up. And I think that's what A2B is really trying to do. So we started on the fuel card side because uh, fuel is the number one cost for running the trucking company. And outside of fuel, we're also extending our, the same systems to payroll. So today we have hundreds of tons of uh, uh, Truck, uh, you know, truck drivers in our network and basically tens of thousands of small businesses who are using us. We are also scaling this to uh, even larger fleets now. So we have uh, not just trucking companies, we have school buses, we have ambulances, we have uh, rental car companies using us. And, and the reason is all of these are commercial vehicles and all of them require uh, payments that are specific to that industry. And, and that, that's the... Uh, real tenure play for us, which is, uh, and to your original point, like how do you think about being Stripe for transportation or, uh, so I think that, that's the approach that Stripe in many ways took, which is like try to build the payments infrastructure and also extend it to multiple use cases. They started with uh, payments for developer teams, like small two person startups who wanted to get an app out uh, accept credit card under the app and now they support marketplaces they support companies as big as Amazon too and that evolution happened because they invested in that infrastructure layer and, and th that's the process we are also taking so before we get to the you know last few big picture questions one more zoom in question about the industry so a key detail about most if not all truckers is that they're operating as independent contractors right. 1099s and it seems to me that a lot of the problems you're describing, the checks, the inconvenience, a couple of those infrastructure problems, I can see those being problems for the individual contractors themselves, but why would a trucking company particularly care in terms of 
the different ways that maybe the status quo is ossified, isn't really keeping up with the times, um, is their alignment with, let's say, someone who runs a trucking company seeing the problem of only paying via checks and the actual trucker, 1099 employee, who's experienced that inconvenience. You kind of get what I'm asking? I, I do. So uh, the way I think about uh, payments is uh, effectively if you introduce any version of friction or latency, fr friction being you have to do things on a physical piece of paper like effectively checks or you have to do things slowly, it adds to overall cost of operations. So for a trucking company, the incentive to use instant payments is in terms of them saving their own cost of operations, which is they would require lesser working capital. They don't have to go to expensive sources of capital to effectively fund their operations. They don't have to wait for three to five business days for their uh, ACH to process to actually receive money. So it's not just the small business uh, owners who are suffering from this, it's also uh, the even mid-sized businesses or larger ones who have this issue where if, if you are a trucking company and you have delivered a load, you still have to wait 30 days to get your payment uh, in place. And, and, and that net 30 payment terms eats into your margins because you have to then go to an expensive source of working capital to continue to operate. And why not have just-in-time funding? Why not operate uh, at the same scale and same speed as an online uh, commerce company? And, and so if you uh, look at uh, merchants, for example, on Shopify, Shopify merchants get paid pretty much same day or instantly and uh, Shopify uh, along with Stripe have built all these instant payments uh, for, for online merchants. Trucking is nowhere close to that reality and, uh, and also the very use of uh, paper and also legacy tools leads to all sorts of uh, potential for fraud and misuse of these instruments. And so we often hear how small business owners talk about Truckers losing their fuel cards and you know getting defrauded for tens of thousands of dollars, or you know uh, the, all, all sorts of uh, inefficiencies that creep in because the, these instruments are not modern by nature. They don't have the same security tools what a uh, uh, card like us have or the payment system that we have developed has. And so, any version of such inefficiencies is not good for the system. It, it basically creates, uh, makes the operations more expensive and also uh, the trucking companies are a lot more fragile because they're operating under thin margins. Mm. So two last big questions here. Mm -hmm. So number one, like once again, the series is focused on, like you said, like big important problems that need to be solved. It seems as if the various ways you've intersected with the transportation category, whether it's the self-driving vehicles or it's the commuting and busing and public transportation to the obvious trucker issue, I feel as if you've had opportunities to look at transportation across the United States broadly. Um, I would love to hear just like your broad takeaway. You're looking at it through the, all these different ways. Do you have an informed opinion on the supply chain problem, infrastructure issues, individual difficulties that folks could experience. Just what's your big takeaway? Oh, the big takeaway is all of these are solvable problems. <laughs> so it, it requires focus. Good to hear. Requires... <laughs> we don't need you to say, oh, by the way, it's over. There's nothing that can be done. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, in, in many ways, uh, uh, if you think about uh, uh, co uh, uh, complexity as an issue, like uh, everything uh, uh, which grows in scale and has diverse uh, set of actors, there is always some level of brittleness. So there are things that will continue to fail, whether it's payments, whether it's supply chain issues, whether it's ports getting choked because of uh, due to you know uh, lab labor loss or due to effectively uh, uh, unforeseen weather conditions or, or any, any other versions of them. So the key problem is uh, to break it down into uh, the, the key approach is we are taking is to break it down into simpler uh, modules and like focus on solving one problem at a time sequentially. Mm -hmm. And a uh, lot of these are uh, problems of software. Like if you can automate some things through software, it leads to less errors and less cost. In, uh, and in many ways, we're not trying to automate jobs here. What we're trying to really automate is uh, manual tasks. And, and by doing that, people can approach their business with a lot more uh, intentionality versus trying to uh, do busy work, which doesn't help anyone. And, uh, and, and and we want to really 
make sure that the end user, so the end user of the product is someone who's a trucking com a truck, truck driver who's on the front lines of the industry. They are the ones who are like working 12 to 16 hours a day, just like making sure that things reach their destination on time. And whatever we do, we want to make sure that it's simple and elegant so that they don't uh, have to deal with any complexity. And I think the uh, overall supply chain uh, is a, a uh, very interesting and uh, uh, intriguing industry and uh, and we see a secular trend of its scaling and the reason is if you look at trends like e-commerce or the general economy uh, economic uh, trends you would always see trucking growing um, uh, in a decadal timeline it might have cycles like some some cycles it might have disruption some cycles it might have contraction but if you look at it on a decadal cycle it's always growing and that's a long term mm -hmm. bet we are taking which is this is a scaling industry where it's like last mile delivery all the way to long haul uh, fleets and uh, and how do you make sure their fleets are running efficiently making sure not only efficiency in the uh, uh, payment sense but efficiency in the operational sense how do you make sure so our software today helps uh, truck drivers to take the most fuel efficient route so for us uh, our uh, we win only if our customers win and to do that we have to make sure that they uh, spend the least amount of money on fuel and make sure that they're driving the most fuel efficient routes and so we have been actively promoting that and guiding drivers to do that and that has roughly saved our customers 5 to 10 percent straight and and this is one of those industries where disproportionate amount of greenhouse gas emissions happen because of the intense nature of semis and uh, and uh, in, any version of savings we are able to uh, provide to our customers is actually indirectly benefiting the climate and so it's both a win-win situation where uh, we don't have to ask them to compromise on their uh, operating uh, guidelines while also making sure that they're saving money and it's better for the planet. I think the wrap-up question here, um, obviously you, you talked a bit about your, your on-deck experience in person right before the pandemic hit. The good news for um, both you know you and also current and prospective on deck founders is that we're we're back in person in San Francisco. So I'd Glad love to hear, to hear just from you a little bit about um, your on deck experience, but also broadly speaking, I'd love for you just to give some broad advice for prospective founders who may be looking at a program like on deck. Obviously, like on deck's great with child on deck, but I think you've got a really interesting set of challenges that I think any founder or prospective founder career take away from. So let's, let's hear about just on deck and then also what your broad advice for, I think people like yourself, circa 2019 or thinking of their next thing. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I was just mentioning earlier before the uh, uh, meeting that uh, I was in the first uh, few batches of on deck where things were happening, uh, uh, where physical events were happening and effectively uh, you know, uh, it was such a good learning experience for me because I, I was somebody who did not have much experience with, uh, uh, you know, starting a company in the US. And uh, I got to learn a ton from some of the founders and experienced operators that OnDeck had. And for me, uh, that was the most invaluable thing we could I could take. I might not necessarily have to know anything uh, about trucking or that specific industry uh, to be connected to those founders, but the type of problems any early stage company faces are very similar in, in that how do you talk to customers, how do you uh, shortlist the, or narrow down the set of problems you want to work on and uh, how do you prioritize uh, uh, between the different uh, things you have to do as an early stage founder between product development to uh, like fundraising to doing things which are like you know, uh, operational in nature. And all of these are like uh, uh, things that uh, it's always helpful to talk to fellow founders and operators and share notes. And uh, that's something I found the most valuable from OnDeck. And uh, I, I think uh, the OnDeck team has also consistently uh, tried to create a uh, theme of giving back. And, uh, you know, uh, anytime an OnDeck uh, 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 fellow reaches out to me, I try to still help in any way possible and, and that was partly because of my sense of gratitude to the larger on deck community because when we were just uh, getting started uh, a lot of these founders did the same to us and uh, i think that's a very important uh, uh, 
component of fostering any healthy ecosystem like us. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, glad uh, I got to be part of the Arnda community. That's a great place to leave things. Um, Vignan, any any um, websites, blog posts, podcasts <laughs> um, you've done that any interested listeners should check out afterwards? No, absolutely. So I, I mean, I, I like to uh, uh, read and gift books. Uh, that's one hobby I try to uh, uh, continue to do. Uh, it's uh, getting a bit uh, harder. Uh, I mean, weekdays are harder to read now, but I'm trying to still catch up on some reading on weekends. But I think uh, one, some of the best places I got to uh, get new recommendations for books has been uh, th through like listening to good podcasts from about other, other founders. So like the podcasts I've been listening lately are like the founders by David Sendra, who basically has like this fairly uh, 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 rather obsessive sense of uh, obsessive way of like going through biographies of other founders and like uh, b b uh, uh, businessmen of like uh, different era and like just like crystallizing that and actually sharing that with his audience and I think that that's one of the podcasts I really like and you know uh, uh, I really like to just like listen to uh, uh, things that are usually 10 years and older because usually things that have stood the uh, test of time are much more uh, useful and valuable it can apply to uh, YouTube videos or it can apply to books too so a uh, lot of times anything that's happening of current in nature can be a lot of noise versus having enough signal. So uh, <laughs> I try to stay away from like current news that way. And it's a bit distracting, especially when you're a founder, you have to deal with a lot of other things. And uh, like news is not one thing I try to consume my uh, information from. And uh, yeah, and uh, I, I think uh, outside of books, uh, so, um, um, both OnDeck has a fairly ex uh, extensive uh, resources for early stage companies, but also uh, I particularly like uh, essays by uh, folks like Paul Graham, who uh, really talk about uh, like the early uh, stages of the business, but also like uh, the building the right foundations uh, as a startup, from how to think about a co-founder all the way to how to build an early stage team, how to find product market fit. All these are like uh, classic essays that are in some sense timeless in nature and uh, similarly I find uh, uh, biographies actually very helpful. So uh, as a founder whenever I'm reading biographies of uh, others uh, I really can empathize and also relate to like all the things they had to do to all the things they had to get right uh, and they could be people who build railroads uh, uh, they could one of my uh, one of the books I really like is a book called the box and uh, it, it's a fascinating story of how uh, someone named uh, I have a copy of oh, great. the box here somewhere um, oh I'm just I'm gonna get up just because yeah, we're gonna please. make this happen yeah that's I feel that's such an underrated book for anyone. This is not so just, exciting. Yes. The box. Read the box. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean. Uh, what's the box about? Yeah, tell people. Tell pe it's, it's very imprecise based on what, what's the book about? The book is about shipping containers. And it, it's about uh, a man who tried to standardize an industry by building uh, a shipping container. And, uh, and it actually talks about the power of the individual in that. Uh, like the, the world around us is also built by uh, you know people who with high levels of conviction and wanted a certain uh, way of operating and and and, and like uh, uh, without giving too much details what I can share is like the uh, uh, the protagonist in the box is somebody who was like a World War II veteran and wanted to just improve his uh, 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 sh shipping business and he figured like why should you know there be so much inefficiency with uh, uh, like how uh, trucks are operating and how containers are operating. So he standardized it and after standardizing, it significantly reduced the price of global commerce by orders of magnitude. And it took several decades for the entire industry to operate, but if he did not build that initial uh, versions and like showed that this is actually good, it wouldn't have happened uh, 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 in such uh, fast timelines. And I think that, that also, uh, is how most industries move forward when you 
try to standardize something and i feel uh, uh, books like box i i re- recently uh, co- co- completed a book on vanderbilt and uh, and these are folks who you know ba- build railroads or shipping and there's enormous levels of uh, pain and uh, 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 also challenges they had to face to build such empires but it also shows that it is possible that these are actually problems in um, uh, you know which are eventually can be solved uh, you have to be methodical about approaching these problems you have to uh, have some levels of uh, uh, <laughs> i would say superhuman level of con- conviction when it comes to uh, like uh, building such, such things but at the same time these are uh, like humans these are people who are like uh, all of mm. us and uh, in that uh, uh, they just were much more patient when others gave up they were much more uh, uh, had clearer uh, lines of thought on what are things they should not be doing and what are things they should be doing and they're also in many ways students of their own industry where they understood that they don't know everything and they have to constantly learn and constantly uh, unlearn and relearn and and i think that, that that's uh, something i really enjoy uh, from biographies i'm i'm smiling because uh, i wasn't precise enough with my closing question which is basically asking you to just shout out your company website but you actually <laughs> just gave no no seriously like I wanted to keep going because you actually just gave a really substantive and super interesting set of recommendations that I actually want folks to actually go to so the actual last question can you shout out your website so anyone <laughs> who's interested in learning more about your company aside from just your book recommendations could learn more yes it is uh my uh personal website is uh, vignanv.com it has some of my, the books i have read over time and my company website is a2b.com uh we are actively hiring if uh, and we would love a ton of help and uh, if anyone's uh, in the ordnic community or beyond are looking forward to working on solving problems in logistics problems in payments we would more than happy to hear you and thank you awesome thank you for joining us on the deep end Have a good one.